What is the Hubble tension? Why is it causing this huge crisis in cosmology? And is the Big Bang finally busted? So Danny, what is the Hubble tension? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to do some background information. You know, in four years, in 2028, we're going to be celebrating the centennial of discovery of the Hubble relation. Many people think that Evan Hubble then discovered the expansion of the universe. He really didn't. What he discovered was a correlation between redshift and distances of galaxies. The, the simplest interpretation of that is expansion of the universe. Now, when I say redshift, I'm talking about how fast things in the universe appear to be getting farther and farther apart. We do that with spectroscopy. We measure the spectrum of, of galaxies. We measure their absorption lines they have in their spectrum. And we uh, do basically the kind of science we can do here on the Earth to determine speeds uh, by doing that. The redshifts are often expressed as kilometers per second and the distances are expressed in a megaparsec. A megaparsec is the distance, uh, well, it's, a, it's about uh, three, and a half, three and a quarter million light years, to put it that mm -hmm. way, for people. So it's a pretty big unit. It's a really big distance. Yeah. So the Hubble relation uh, has, a, has a linear slope, a linear relationship between redshift and distance. And uh, to express how rapidly the, the universe is expanding, getting back to that terminology again, we want to get the slope of that line. And the value that Hubble got in 1928, 1929 was 550 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And he did that by measuring distances to galaxies the best he could back then. Well, 100 years, we've come a long way. We've built bigger telescopes. We've made more sensitive detectors. We've made advances in other technology. And more importantly, we've made advances in our understanding of many astrophysical objects, such as galaxies, uh, supernovae, uh, Cepheid variables, all sorts of things. So the value of the Hubble constant decreased steadily until around 1960, when it reached 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And it stayed there much of my lifetime. Then about 30 years ago, uh, they decided to start increasing that again as, again, technology improved. Now, the gold standard uh, for this has become what we call type 1A supernovae. Uh, the reason why we, we like those is because they can be seen at tremendous distances, billions of light years. The problem we've always had is that we can get distances to nearby galaxies pretty, pretty accurately, uh, but we can't get it for very distant galaxies until type 1A supernovae came along. Now, redshifts mm -hmm. are not easy, not difficult to do. They just need a large telescope and a lot of light to, to work with. It takes time, but you can do it. But getting that correlation is difficult because nearby galaxies don't have much what we call Hubble flow. Mm -hmm. But distant galaxies do, but we don't know their distances. So that's why type 1A supernovae come in. Right, so the nearby galaxies, we know their distance pretty well, but we don't know, we don't know the redshift very well, whereas far away distances, we know the redshift, but yeah. we don't know the yeah. distance. So it's kind of a catch-22 there. Yeah, and I should, I should point out, I'm talking about a corrected redshift, because redshifts always have, it can be two terms involved. One's cosmological redshift, and the other one caused by, again, perhaps expansion of the universe. The other is local effects of gravita gravity. Mm -hmm. And the gravitational effects swamp the, uh, the redshift of, of due to cosmology at, uh, at nearby distances. But at great distances are not important at all. Hence the need to go far to do this. Yeah, so in, in general, you would say finding redshifts of galaxies is pretty straightforward, but trying to find distances a little bit more complicated, a little bit more difficult. There. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's what's causing. It. And the, the the type one type one A supernova really neat for this. We've known about them for a long time, and when I, early in my career, that was the, the 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 future of this. But how do you get there? Uh, a supernova is an eruption of of a star, making it much brighter than it used to be. In the case of type one A supernovae, we classify them different ways, by the way. But type one A all have the seem to have the same peak brightness when they reach their peak maximum brightness. It's a very narrow range, and we can unambiguously identify type 1a supernova if we have enough data on them, enough observations. So when you see a type 1a supernova near its peak, you know really how bright it is, and then it's very straightforward to calculate from that its distance by measuring how bright it appears to us. It's a standard thing we often do. Now, um, the problem is, is that type 1a supernovae occur maybe once a century in a given galaxy. So you either have to be very lucky or you have to kind of play the odds better. And the neat thing that came along in the 1990s were robotic telescopes that uh, looked at uh, a bunch of galaxies, hundreds of, or maybe even thousands per night, 
they took a, a, a template photograph of the galaxy, and then the, the telescope would go from galaxy to galaxy to galaxy, comparing new photos it took to the templates, subtract it off, and if a spot of light was left, that told you it was some sort of nova that took place. Mm -hmm. They could then send an automatic message to an observatory where astronomers could zero in with a bigger telescope and start take recording data. So by the mid-1990s, we actually had uh, good distances now for uh, several dozen or several score of these Type 1a supernovae. And then we could also get the redshift of the host galaxies, and voila, you get a very good Hubble relation. And uh, Adam Reese is one of the guys who has uh, become kind of the guru of this. He's been doing this for 30 years and kind of the world expert on doing this. And so he's developed... Uh, uh, his, his observations over the years. He slightly improves it for every year or two with new data that he's collected. But he's uh, found that the expansion rate of the universe is around 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Mm -hmm. So that's the one um, more observational uh, direct approach of trying to measure the Hubble constant. But there's another approach that other uh, astronomers like to use a little bit more. So I'll go ahead and explain that one. Oh, yeah, that was a very different one, very different approach. And it uh, relies on what we call the cosmic microwave background, the CMB for short. It was predicted in 1948 as a result of the, uh, of the Big Bang model, and it was discovered in 1964. And the uh, other cosmologies of the day could not explain it. And so within a few years, the um, Big Bang became the dominant cosmology and has been for more than a half century. Uh, by the way, I've uh, published uh, here on our Answers Research Journal my interpretation of what I think is causing the CMB. I don't think it's from a Big Bang because we don't accept the Big Bang because it's not biblical at all. So, and real quick, why don't we accept the Big Bang? Well, it's billions of years. <laughs> it, it has the stars and the other objects before the Earth. You know, those are two biggies right there. And we believe the Earth was made at the beginning and the stars were made later. And you can't, mm -hmm. you can't really uh, make that jibe with the, uh, with the modern cosmology of Big Bang. Yeah, inconsistent with yeah. the order of events. Also, the Big Bang is a naturalistic origin story. So it's based on a whole different set of beliefs and trying to mix that with your Christianity. That's syncretism. No that's God required, you know, is the whole point about Big Bang. People don't realize that that's yeah. what it's all about, like yeah. any evolutionary idea or naturalistic yeah. idea, I should say. The CMB has been studied extensively. They've had uh, three different satellites, uh, one 30 years ago, one 20 years ago, one 10 years ago, uh, studying this from space, uh, getting its structure. Uh, it's, it's, got, it's dappled with warmer and cooler regions. There's a lot we could talk about with that, but mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of neat things, details in it, and what people have done is they've assumed the Big Bang model, and uh, they can then go to the, the structure of the CMB, that fine structure we see in it, and model that through the Big Bang, and they can actually tweak out of that a value of the Hubble constant. And if the Big Bang model is correct, then it ought to give us the same value you get observationally. And they've done this, and they get mm -hmm. about 67 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. Yeah. So yeah. just to kind of recap, that's essentially the crisis here. You have this observational method of saying uh, it's 73 uh, kilometers per second megaparsecs. The other one is 67 kilometers per second megaparsec. And that doesn't seem like a big difference, but it is statistically, right? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, that wouldn't have been a big difference at all because uh, the crudity of the methods, but they've come a long way, as I said. Mm -hmm. And uh, that difference of about 10% between the two values uh, greatly exceeds the, uh, the, the statistical probable errors in these things. When they, when they get 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec, it's like plus or minus six tenths of, of a kilometer per second per megaparsec. And the other one's like the same way. There are several uh, uh, sigmas separated from mm -hmm. each other. And so the big crisis is why are they so different? I, I, they ought to agree. And, you know, I don't know, when you've done science classes and stuff in the mm -hmm. past, physics classes, it's really great to, to, to measure something two different ways. Mm -hmm. And if you get the same value two different ways, then you know that it's probably correct. Mm -hmm. But if you measure it two different ways and you get different values, then you know there's a problem somewhere. And that's what they realized today. I think we should call it the Hubble Trouble. I think that rhymes Hubble a little trouble bit more. Hubble Trouble works so better, yeah. Trouble with the Hubble. Um, so in order to explain this Hubble tension, there's basically two different options. Either something's wrong with the observations, the direct observations, or there's something wrong with our understanding of the, of the CMB or the standard model. Which one do secular astronomers typically choose to believe? They choose to believe both or neither. Uh, they're, they're, there's, that's the reason why there's a, there's a problem here, because they are so convinced that both ought to agree with one another 
that they're truly baffled. As an observational astronomer, I've always considered myself to be that. I'm always going to side with the observations. If the observations don't agree with your theory, then I'm sorry, your theory is almost certainly wrong. Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, many astronomers can't see the difference between the two of those. But I, I like observations because that's what I do. I've always done that. It, it's, I take images of, of things. I photo, photograph things with, with telescopes and cameras. Mm -hmm. And you have a book of that, some of those observations. Yeah, right? I do. It's uh, called The Heavens, uh, A Different View. It's a beautifully illustrated picture book. It's uh, got pictures of galaxies in it. It's, uh, it's got pictures of nebulae and everything else. Mm -hmm. I took some of these photos myself. But to tell you the truth, uh, there are better photographers out there than me, astrophotographers. So I've got two other gentlemen uh, who are friends of the ministry, amateur astronomers, and they have taken uh, many of the photos in here. So, folks, this book is really a, really a delight. I enjoyed writing it. I enjoy talking about it because it's a beautiful book. Yeah, and my family, we have it. My three kids, they love it. They look at all the awesome pictures. That motivates them to go outside and start looking at the stars. Yeah, you know, Rob, part of the problem with science is that we it's something we, we read about, we learn about in school, but we don't actually do. And one of the neat things about astronomy is that if you're just reading about it in a book or learning about it in school, you've not really done it. God gave us two eyeballs and appreciation in our hearts and our minds for the mm -hmm. world around us. And uh, astronomy is a really cool thing. You can see these things for yourself. So you're saying get off the couch and go outside and turn off the look lights. Look at God's creation. Yep. So it sounds like some of the new data coming in from James Webb Space Telescope, it's been confirming a lot of the previous observations made by Adam Reese and his, his team. So does that mean the model is wrong? I think so. The news item recently was that a team led by Adam Reese used the James Webb Space Telescope, where they've been using the Hubble Space Telescope and Ground Based Telescope, and they've extended their they're reached with a James Webb Space Telescope, and what they found out is the value he's been pushing for the Hubble constant all along is coming through once again. Yeah. So yes, I, uh, observations always have to trump theory. So I think it's time that they have to look back at this, and some, some scientists, including Adam Reese, are starting to see that. Yeah, so going back to um, the fact that they always question the observation, the human error, so that's what makes them measure again and again and keep remeasuring, remeasuring, and trying to figure out, is the observations wrong? But Adam Reese, he went and stated after the new data came in, he said, with measurement errors negated, what remains is the real and exciting possibility that we have misunderstood the universe. So the observations are telling us one thing, the model's saying something different. So does that mean secular astronomers are ready to abandon their secular models? I don't think so. I think Adam Reese, what he meant by that was we need to, 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 to redo the, the Big Bang model, make some changes to it. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's ready to abandon it. There aren't many astronomers who are willing to do that. But at least they're, they're getting the message there's something wrong here somewhere. They just don't know what it is. Yes. I think it's at the foundation of the thing, but they think it's just the tweaking uh, that needs to be done. Yeah, so again, the observations based on the Hubble Space Telescope as well as the James Webb Space Telescope is giving us a number of 73, whereas the CMB, the more model dependence, is giving us a, a number of 67. And so. And the two cannot be reconciled. And they cannot be reconciled. It can't be both correct. Is that That's correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, as we often say at our ministry all the time, wrong assumptions leads to wrong conclusions. And so, what's the biblical reason why secular astronomers are unwilling to reconsider their naturalistic beliefs about the universe? Uh, it's because they've so committed to naturalism. You know, the way science has developed over the last couple of centuries is that um, we've, we've, we've brought God less and less into it. You know, it's interesting that the development of science as we know it was in, it was in the 17th century, 400 years ago. And it was led by, by people heavily influenced by Christianity and biblical Christianity. And they saw unity in the world because they saw unity in the Creator, because they believed in the Creator. There weren't any atheists among those people back then for mm -hmm. the most part. They were, they were theists, very, very deeply involved and influenced by Christianity, as I said. So they saw this unity, but somewhere along the line we've lost our way. Uh, we begin to realize, well, the, 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 work, the world works uh, like by clockwork. 400 mm -hmm. years ago, people realized it was the clockwork was being imposed by the Creator. But uh, now we say, well, the, the universe just works that way because it works that way. And they don't give any thought beyond that. And so uh, that may not, they may not be atheists. In fact, I've met very few astronomers who are atheists. Most of them aren't. But they, even, even the most devout people sometimes can just kind of forget and so they, they get so enwrapped in studying the world apart from the Creator that they really don't give Him much thought at all. Mm -hmm. And so you're always looking for natural explanations behind things rather than recognizing the ultimate answers to the ultimate questions in life cannot be answered by science. And so that's why they don't question the model, because they can't question the model. If they question the model, that means they're giving up their beliefs of naturalism. The only alternative 
is creation. That's obviously not something that they want. No. And so referring to biblical creation, what do a lot of these observations mean for biblical creationists? Well, I don't know yet. Uh, well, I've been working for years trying to develop a creation, truly creation uh, model of cosmology, one based on the Bible. We're given very few specifics uh, in Scripture, which gives us a lot of freedom. But we also have very few workers. I used to be able to count on one hand how many astronomers, uh, creation astronomers we have. I'm on the second hand now, by the way. But uh, I, want to, um, I want to encourage young people uh, who may be watching and listening to us today who have an aptitude for this and may feel a calling uh, we need more astronomers and need to replace people as myself as we get older. So uh, I'm hoping the next generation of creation astronomers can perhaps begin to develop a model that's eluded me so far. Yeah, and so speaking of biblical creation as well, maybe someone watching is maybe wondering, um, what about those Bible verses that talks about God stretching out the heavens? Does that help explain some of the expansion of the space that we're seeing? Yeah, there's about a dozen a dozen uh, passages in the Old Testament that's meant to talk about the expansion or the, the spreading of the heavens. And um, I, for many, many years, I thought that was referring to expansion of the universe. I've changed my mind now about a, about a decade ago. I believe it's talking about what happened on day two when God made this thing called a rakia, an expanse, yeah. it says, on, on day two. And I, I think in, in some of the uh, tenses we find, uh, past tense of an action there in some of those Old Testament passages, I think it's referring to the creation week rather than what's going on today. Might the expansion or, or redshift, however you interpret it, uh, be a, a kind of a consequence or a residual of that? It probably could be, but I just don't know yet. Yeah. Do biblical creationists, do they have any other explanation for the Hubble law other than the expansion of space? Uh, no, we don't yet. And uh, we're divided on that. I have no problem with the universe expanding at all. It's just nothing that I can see that the Bible necessarily predicts, but it could be a consequence of, mm -hmm. of uh, some model you may, de you may develop based upon that. Yeah, so based on what we see, what we observe in the universe today, based on Adam Reese's work um, in terms of the measured value of the Hubble constant, do, as, do we as biblical creationists, do we have any problem trying to accept those, those values? No, we don't. I have no problem at all. I think, I think the data speak for themselves, and I'm very confident of those data. Um, I, of course, new data may, may replace it. That's always happened. Uh, but as our best understanding now, I, I'd like his value of 73. Yeah, 73 kilometers per second, per megaparsec. megaparsec yeah. Got it right. Yeah. Here at Answers in Genesis, we assert the authority of God's Word, and we're all about equipping the next generation with answers. I want to encourage young people seeking out God's will for their lives. You should uh, ask the Lord what, what He wants you to do. I'm thinking particularly of two young people, uh, Colin, age 11, out of Finley, Ohio, and also Violet, who recently graduated from Answers Academy here in northern Kentucky. I understand that you're pursuing or wanting to pursue a career as an astronaut. Maybe we've never met, but I would encourage you to seek God's will in your life to follow whatever it is He wants you to do. If it's astronomy, being an astronaut, whatever, pursue that with everything you have as if you're doing to the Lord because you are. So what is the Hubble tension? It's the two totally different values we get for the expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant. And why is it causing this huge crisis in cosmology? Because most astronomers believe that both values should agree with one another, and they don't. And is the Big Bang finally busted? It could be. This could be the beginning of the end of the Big Bang.